Susie Lamplew. Susie Lamplew was a 25-year-old aspiring real estate agent living in London. Described as a lover of life, she had a propensity of living every day to the fullest. Susie was just starting what seemed to be a promising future. But after making an appointment with a potential client on July 28, 1986, a Mr. Kipper, to show a property on Shorelds Road in Fulham, she was never seen again. Susie's Ford Fiesta was found parked by another property up for sale on Stevensage Road, which was one and a half miles from the appointment address, Shorelds Road. Police compared the DNA of over 800 unidentified bodies, but none were a match to Susie. In the year 2000, convicted murderer John Canan is questioned, but never charged with Susie's murder. Canan was charged in 1988 for the slaying of Shirley Banks. By this time, Susie had been declared legally dead, even though no body had been found. During the investigation of Shirley Banks' murder, it would be revealed that John Canan had a specific nickname in prison, Kipper. This was the same name that Susie wrote down in her appointment book as being the name of the person she would meet the day she went missing. Kipper is also another word for herring, maybe a mocking message to the police that the false name given was a red herring for investigators. After five female prostitutes were subsequently killed in Suffolk, Police interviewed the Suffolk Strangler, Steve Wright, in May of 2007, as he actually had worked with Susie in the early 80s, but he too denied involvement. To date, no viable leads have turned up, and police have said publicly that they still believe Canaan to be the killer. As Susie went missing around the same time as John Canaan's crime spree and Susie, like Canaan's targets, was a professional woman. Patrick Warren and David Spencer. On the evening of December 26, 1986, just one day after the Christmas celebrations, Patrick Warren and David Spencer were out on a late night stroll in Chelmsley Wood on the outskirts of Birmingham. Warren and Spencer were riding Patrick Warren's brand new red bicycle, which had been a Christmas present. The boys had been spotted by a police officer earlier that afternoon, playing with another group of children in Meridian Park, where they had been warned by the officer to not play on the frozen pond. After returning home, they told their parents of their plans to visit one of Patrick's brothers that evening. Derek Warren, another brother, went looking for them the next day when he found out that they had never arrived. The last known sighting of the boys was just after midnight by a petrol attendant who gave them a packet of biscuits. Patrick Warren's brand new red Apollo bicycle was found abandoned by the petrol station near the trash bins. The petrol station attendant said they saw the boys walking towards the local shopping center. That would be the last time that they were ever seen alive. Soon after, the children were reported missing. Officers still speculated to reporters that the boys were playing some big game or that they were simply staying with friends. They were not taking the missing children seriously. Police offered 500 euros to anybody with information, believing that whomever the boys were staying with would quickly give them up, but no one called in any viable leads. In an effort to raise awareness, the supermarket Iceland utilized the techniques of an American ad campaign, which placed the pictures of missing kids on the backs of milk cartons. This would make the faces of David and Patrick present in 770 stores across England. However, no tips were ever proven to be credible. One major possibility is that Brian Field, who was living mere miles from where the boys went missing, was somehow involved he would have most likely utilized the same petrol station at which the boys were last seen. Brian Field was later convicted of the rape and murder of a Surrey schoolboy, Roy Chutil, which happened in 1968, but with no bodies and no direct evidence leading to him, Fields has never confessed or even been a prime suspect. 
largely because he was never investigated. All of the sex offenders in the area were questioned but ruled out. To date, the boys have never been found. Families' houses have been searched and investigated. The property of Brian Fields has been investigated as well. Rewards have been offered. Pawns have been drained. There are no leads. The police consider this a no-body murder. Josephine Backshaw A religious and naive housewife in need of a job, Josephine Backshaw posted an advertisement in the local newspaper that used the phrasing, quote, anything considered, end quote. Being a wife and a mother of three, this 39-year-old housewife believed she was being recruited to model cosmetics when a man named Peter telephoned her. This man would go on to speak with Josephine via telephone and subsequently would come to photograph her on the front lawn of her house. Josephine told her husband that this man was, quote, of a good sort, end quote, and that she seemed to trust him, though she had no actual reason to. Josephine had made an appointment with this man to meet and discuss her potential job as the cosmetics model. They went to a pub called the Fountain Public House in Good Easter at the late hour of 10.30 p.m. Three days later, on November 1st, she would be found with her hands tied and her neck strangled. Surprisingly, there was no sign of sexual assault, although some acts can leave no trace. She was found fully clothed in a pond on Bury Green Lane in North Bishop's Stortford. The only person to recall the two was the owner of the public house, who recalled the unusualness of the shifty male companion of Josephine's, who was so tall that his head brushed against the hanging beer growlers. Upon autopsy, it would be revealed that her last meal was Chinese food, though from where it was unknown. Her watch stopped at 8.15 p.m., although on what date it is unknown. Though an arrest was made in 2014, the man was subsequently released on bail and has never been re-questioned. Police have reached out for the public's help, but so far have received no credible leads. Jill Dando during the second half of the 1990s, English television presenter and journalist Jill Dando was one of the BBC's best-known personalities. She was the host of numerous TV shows, including Crime Watch, a documentary series that presents dramatic reconstructions of unsolved murders. Ironically, Dando would later become the victim of an unsolved murder and would be featured on the show that she herself used to narrate. On the morning of April 26th, 1999, Jill Dando left her fiancé's home. Traveling by car, she went shopping and then to her own house in Fulham. She approached the front door and she was shot dead. Her body was discovered around 14 minutes later by a neighbor. Jill was rushed to the hospital, but she was declared dead on arrival. Forensic investigations found she had been shot by a 9mm caliber automatic pistol with the gun pressed against her head at the moment she was shot. Pressing the gun against her head would have silenced the fatal shot and prevented her killer from being splattered with blood. Police struggled to find any evidence leading to her killer, though they believed her murder was the work of a deranged fan. Eventually, their attention focused on Barry George, a local man who was obsessed with celebrities, guns, and women. George was a lonely stalker with a collection of 4,000 photographs he had taken of women he had seen on the streets. He claimed that he was the cousin of Freddie Mercury and allegedly held a grudge against the BBC because he believed they covered his cousin too negatively. Despite his insistence that he was innocent, George was initially convicted of Dando's murder in 2001 based on flimsy evidence about a speck of gunpowder residue found inside his pocket. But on August 1, 2008, after a second appeal, George was exonerated and released from prison. The residue in his pocket, the court reasoned, might have come from somewhere else. Furthermore, the murder weapon had never been recovered and George had been ruled intellectually incapable of being able to carry out the crime. To date, the crime still hasn't been solved. It led to widespread speculation. 
One theory was that Dando was targeted as part of a revenge crime for a story she had investigated herself on Crime Watch. Others believed she'd been the victim of a professional assassin, hired by someone who wanted her dead. Another suggested she'd been killed by the Serbian Mafia. This was the time of the Kosovo War, and Dando had presented a charity appeal on behalf of the Kosovo refugees. She later received a letter from a Serbian source condemning this action. Also, the NATO bombings of the Serbian TV headquarters had taken place three days prior to Dando's death. It was theorized that she may have been killed by Serbian extremists in retaliation for the charity appeal or even for the bombing. The case remains open and unsolved. Gareth Williams a Welsh mathematician who dropped out of his graduate studies in order to join England's Secret Intelligence Service Agency, codebreaker Gareth Williams was known for being intensely dedicated to his job on the clock and uncommonly private, well off the clock. Williams' work primarily concerned researching and tracking cash flows from Russia to Europe. After not being in attendance at work for seven days, concerned colleagues contacted police out of concern for William, age 31, as he was a man of habit and never absent, especially without warning. By the time police performed a welfare check on August 23, 2010, at William's flat in Pimlico, London, which was an SIS safe house, he had been dead for seven days. Williams was found stripped of clothes in a red North Face duffel bag, which was padlocked from the outside. The key to the lock was placed inside the bag under his body. The heater had been turned up and the rate of decomposition rapidly increased due to the warm air, greatly reducing the ability to test for toxins or swab for DNA. It was determined by the coroner that Williams had died of a lack of oxygen or an overabundance of carbon dioxide as a result of breathing out in the bag but not having fresh air to breathe back in. The coroner would speculate that the lack of bruising and the manner of death indicated that he may have been alive when put into the bag. There was no DNA on the handles of the duffel bag or on the edges of the tub. No fingerprints or even smudges could be detected. This further indicated a cleanup after the fact. Williams was last seen alive on August 15th, but not reported missing until August 23rd. There was a five-hour window of unaccounted for time between when William's sister notified the GCHQ of William's not answering any calls and when police were actually notified, which some believe might be indicative of a cover-up. Dr. Fiona Wilcox, the medical examiner on the case, ruled the death as, quote, unnatural and likely to have been criminally mediated. She chastised Scotland Yard for failing to classify William's death as a murder, instead only classifying it as, quote, suspicious and unexplained. Her ruling relies partially on the fact that she hired two forensic investigators to replicate the scene, and in their 400 attempts, they could not get into the bag and then still be able to lock it from the outside. From the beginning, the interagency scrambling led to missing items and scene contamination. Prior to the police investigators cataloging the scene, all of the house's locks and door handles were removed, and other unknown items may have been removed as well. Unfortunately, their strongest lead was DNA present on William's hand. For many months, the DNA was investigated, as the lab had coded it as being unidentifiable but later it would be found that this supposed key piece of evidence was simply contamination from the crime scene investigation team that first responded to the body. As that was the only DNA sample found, the realization would be a blow to the investigation as no other leads existed. To outside observers, it would seem obvious that William's death was not an accident at all, but some background evidence focused on by critics of the investigation attempt to throw into question the highly private spy's sexual proclivities. William's old landlady testified that her husband and she were awoken by William's screams one night 
and after rushing to his bedroom, the landlady found Williams tied to the bed and unable to escape. He apologized profusely and said that he had tied himself up just to see if he could escape and that he would never try something like that again. Whether this act of tying oneself up was sexual in nature or the research of a spy about to be operationally deployed is unknown. The self-asphyxiation angle is furthered by rumors of Williams visiting websites that featured bondage, and some critics of Williams say that that predilection could have led to an interest in erotic confinement, which could have led to Williams attempting to tie himself up on the bed, as the landlady found, which could have led him to trying to confine himself into a bag. A far-fetched theory, indeed. However, this angle is vehemently ruled out by the medical examiner, who insists that this is not a case of autoerotic containment or asphyxiation. Dr. Wilcox, the coroner, however, does not believe that any sort of autoerotic asphyxiation was involved and that, since Williams was, quote, a scrupulous risk assessor, any attempts to get himself into the bag would have been combined with his possessing of a knife for escape. Another angle focuses on multiple Russian embassy cars parked in the vicinity of Williams' house just days prior to his death. As Williams' work was primarily centered around Russian criminal activity and money laundering, he was understandably a target. Additionally, the method of killing is consistent with Russian intelligence modus operandi, poisoning with an unknown biochemical agent. Boris Karpichkov, an ex-KGB agent that served for more than 10 years and ranked as a KGB major, and who is now in the UK's version of witness protection, has a new identity and tells the real story behind William's death. While it most certainly wasn't caused by William's sexual proclivities, it did involve the KGB blackmailing him with scandalous photos in order for him to become a double agent. Allegedly, Williams was befriended by a fellow GCHQ colleague named Orion, who was actually a double agent for the Russians. Orion introduced Williams to a third party, with whom Williams supposedly had a friendly connection. This Lucas wined and dined Williams, but later spiked his drink and took him to a separate location where he was filmed next to a man and woman who were supposedly in a scandalous position, the specifics which are unknown. Once Williams had come around, the compromising footage was then used as blackmail for Williams to also become a double agent, but this attempt was unsuccessful and the two parted ways. But before leaving, Williams made it clear that any more attempts to blackmail him would result in Orion being reported to MI6 as a Russian double agent. On August 16th, Lucas came back to the flat and somehow drugged Williams in order to kill him. This would prevent any further threats to the valuable Russian mole in GCHQ, who to this day is only known as Orion. Outrageous and fear-inducing assassinations used to deter other detractors to the Russian cause are a common way to die for anyone associated with the Russian KGB. Alexander Litvienko, a Russian agent who received political asylum in the UK, was killed in London just four years earlier using a rare radioactive isotope. Inspector Sutton postulates that, quote, if the motive for Gareth's death was around his job, then poison becomes much more likely. End quote. The former KGB agent Karpichkov speculates that having William's body displayed in such a scandalous way was meant to send a message to future people refusing to become double agents. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, and most likely bowing to pressure to close the sensitive case, London police determined in November of 2012 that Williams, alone, probably got into the bag himself and couldn't get back out again. A special thanks to all of our Patreons, without whom this video would not have been possible. If you'd like to support us and help us continue making these videos, the link to our Patreon page will be in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and if you have any suggestions for future topics, please leave them in the comments below.